Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, you might notice that the setting is a little bit different, uh, different uh, this week. I'm actually broadcasting from Taipei, Taiwan, 7,800 miles away from New York City, which is the headquarters of Photo Shelter. You are listening to I Love Photography. You might be watching us on youtube.com slash photo shelter, or you might be listening to the podcast by searching for I Love Photography on iTunes. We've taken a little break, but I have Sarah Jacobs back there in the uh, studio in New York. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Alan. How you doing? I'm good. I can't believe how long it's been. I've been a lot of places since we last talked. Yes, you have. Tell us, where, where all have you been? Well, two weeks ago, I was in Jackson, Wyoming, formerly Jackson Hole. I don't know when they changed the name, but uh, <laughs> okay. I was at Rich Clarkson's Photography at the Summit Nature Workshop with... Uh, a whole bunch of incredible photographers, Jim Richardson from Nat National Geographic, Jody Cobb from National Geographic, William Aller from National Geographic. Uh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Just just a really incredible. Tom Mangelson is like one of the best nature photographers in the world. Michael Forsberg, another great nature photographer. Um, it's just a magical time of year and a magical place. And then last week, uh, I was in Japan. And wow. now I'm in Taiwan. Wow. When are you coming back stateside? Monday I'll be back stateside. Okay. And, and we couldn't we couldn't show. keep our fans waiting any longer. We had to do an <laughs> they've, episode. They've just been dying. They've been dying. <laughs> yeah. All the things that uh, we love about photography. We have a big show today. We have a lot to talk about. Yeah. Let's we'll catch up on. Why don't we get started? Sounds good. <laughs> do it. Well, first off, we're going to show you a little something here. And this is over on the... Uh, the Lens Blog, which, by the way, got a little redesign a couple weeks ago. Yeah, it got a facelift. It looks amazing. It looks great. It's uh, They went from the totally kind of very dark background to a white background. They went from this weird carousel design to more of a, a vertical serial design. Um, and it just looks a lot more contemporary. Yeah, it looks clean. You can actually see the images very big now, just on, without having to go into full screen, which exactly. I like. Exactly. Fine. Yeah, there's a little bit more room to breathe. I like it. Well, and then check this out. So the article that we're first... We're actually, we have three different stories that we're going to show you from the Lens Blog this week. The first one happens to be the photo editor of the New York Times Magazine, Kathy Ryan, whose Instagram account is the subject of this particular lens uh, entry. And... Uh, it's, it's actually a very interesting little interview. She talks about how she has a little bit more appreciation for photographers as a result of taking photos. Yeah, I'd have to say that this is one of Instagram's great accomplishments is getting Kathy Ryan to experience photography in a new way, you know? Absolutely. <laughs> like, hats off to Instagram. That is, that's fantastic. And she's, an, she's a great photographer, too. Who she's knew? a good photographer. She's a good photographer. I mean, uh, a real sense of light and shadow, which I know is kind of a trite thing to say about photography, but it's true. Yeah. And she uh, says she has a little love affair with the building, the Times building designed by Renzo Piano. A uh, lot of light in that building, huge open floor plans if you've ever been in there. And she said she finds that she doesn't really have a desire to Instagram outside of the building, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> Yeah, she's obviously in love with her work, which is great, and and the building itself. I mean, the way she talks about it is so romantic. She refers to it as kind of her lover. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which I just think is so great. Yeah, the work is really beautiful. So, you know, I, I think this is sort of the clarion call to all photo editors to get onto Instagram and experience taking photos um, and understand where your photographers are coming from. Now, in saying that, though, it's true. Look at these post-it notes. That's, that looks like a flower. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, a lot of photo editors, at least a lot of photo editors that I know, actually started as photographers. Mm -hmm. It's not that much of a stretch to say that the photo editors also love photography and also have an appreciation for photography, but I'm, I'm happy to see Kathy on there. I know. Yeah. It's great. Well, that's one of three, and we kind of scattered them throughout the show today, so we'll come back to the lens in a second. Over on the Slate blog, we talk often about 
uh, how photography can be used to break down stereotypes. And here's a situation where an Iranian photographer, uh, Nafis Matlak, said that she thought that the perception of Iran uh, in the media, particularly in the Western media, really distorted what daily life was like over there in Iran. So she, she started uh, exploring father-daughter relationships in Iran using photography. And so, you know, this opening image, which is a lovely, lovely image of a father sort of kind of holding his daughter's hands up, and she's got a great smile on her face. Um, and then she, she uses this kind of, uh, you know, this quotable, pony-style quotable for these images. And the funny thing is, you know, you would, you would expect that every image is like, oh, life is so great, I love my father. But there's a number <laughs> of images here where the woman says, uh, you know, he's my father. That's all I want to say about it. <laughs> he's my dad. Uh, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah. And I, it made me sort of weirdly uncomfortable, but I liked, you know, when you, when you view the images as a series and you see these quotes you really get a more whole picture of, I mean, it's just like the relationships that we have with our parents here in the West. Some yeah. people have great relationships, some people don't. Some people have nothing to say about it, some people have a lot to say. Yeah, I thought that this, is a, that this series is a really great sampling, and I'm glad that the relationships vary. I mean, father-daughter relationships can be complex, and sh I think she really kind of nailed it by having so many different examples within the series and also the quotes. Um, I do, I, I kind of wonder why she didn't get quotes from the dads about the daughters. Yeah, she that's only, interesting. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'd like to know, you know, are they proud of their daughters? What, what about them? Have they grown to love? Um, that type of thing. But overall, I think the series is great. You know, Sarah, you said a moment ago that father-daughter relationships are, are complicated, and I immediately thought of those purity ball photos that we yes. looked at a few months ago and how yes. weird that, that series was. That is a strange that relationship. <laughs> that is a very weird series. Yeah, but that that's an example where the series is not diverse at all. It's just kind of like the same idea within each image, and so I like that this one kind of goes into a lot of different types of relationships. This particular image is my favorite. It is my favorite too. Why is it your favorite? Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, just I mean the way she's placed them behind the dad the image of the horse behind them and how she's included the gun in the photo. Oh. I mean, it's just... Not only it, the gun, the gun over the little ceramic piece. Right. <laughs> I mean, there's just so many layers in this photo. And let's there read are. the caption here. Uh, Shima and Lena's father is a civil project manager. Uh, quote, our father has studied in Europe. That's why he gave us all the freedom the Western youth have in personal life, they said. And yeah, they're wearing these short little black dresses... Um, kind of dolled up in a Western style, and their hair is bleached blonde. Oh, and they have nose jobs. It looks like it's just fun. It's a funny, funny photo. It really is. I love this picture. That was a great series. That was a great series. <laughs> um, because I was in Japan a week ago, I had to give a little shout out to a Japanese photographer who was featured on the Lens Blog. Um, and the photographer's name is Yukari Chikura, and Yukari uh, said that after the, the big earthquake, the 2011 earthquake that, that caused the, the nuclear reactor, the flooding, and uh, killed a lot of people, and, you know, tidal wave and all this kind of stuff, the tsunami, she was concerned about um, the loss of culture, particularly in kind of the northern part of Japan, um, where these these uh, people were were practicing these different ceremonies and whatnot for like a thousand years. So this woman Yukari Chikura, um, who is not a professional photographer, went up there and started photographing scenes of life. No different than any other photographer that we've covered that said, "I'm going to capture some aspect of of my culture or or or, or someone else's culture um, in." in a more profound way than if I just kind of showed up for a day and shot. Mm -hmm. And I gotta tell you, Sarah, these photos, I mean, for a non-professional, they look mm -hmm. pretty damn good. Yeah, I know. Like, yeah, they're really stunning beautiful. How the, the clarity of the photos, the composition, the mastery of light. Now, 
you know, we're, we're seeing some obviously some toning going on and, and whatnot, but they're great photos. Yeah, yeah, they are. I mean, I I think it is important to note that she, you know, it was is not a professional photographer. She's just kind of getting into it, and how important it is to really go out and photograph what you love because it might get you a spot on the lens blog. You know. Yeah. Um, and and you know the the distinction now between what, you know what constitutes a pro and what constitutes an amateur, you know uh, we can we can keep talking until we're blue in the face because there really is no difference and at least not in terms of skill. Now I will tell you this: I will say that obviously a very skilled professional will be better. I think more consistent than a skilled amateur. But clearly, the the body of this work is fantastic, and and the reason why I point that out is, you know, when I was at uh, the photography at the summit, I'm walking around with Jim Richardson from National Geographic. Jim decided that the only camera he was going to bring was his iPhone. Oh wow! <laughs> so he came to a a photographic workshop where everybody had you know top of the line cameras, and they were using uh, Nikon Professional Services was there. And they were using 600 millimeter lenses and 200 to 400 f/4 lenses and whatnot. And Jim is walking around with his iPhone. And I went out with Jim one day with Michael Forsberg, and we went to a couple different places. And Jim pulled out the iPhone and he starts shooting. And after we're done, I'm seeing photos that he shot on the iPhone, which were just incredible, incredible mm. the way that guy sees. I got off on a tangent, but but what I really wanted to say was. <laughs> Yukari is a great photo uh, photographer, and so is Jim Richardson. <laughs> yeah, well, the playing field is evened out, as we've talked a lot about yeah. with gear, in terms of gear. Great stuff. Um, here's, here's one. Robin Moore, photo shelter user. Yeah, and a very photographer. good friend. Yeah. yeah. We got a little, uh, not only a, a, a website, but a book called In Search of Lost Frogs, um, with some really, really great macro photography. Uh, and, you know, I can never figure out these types of images that you, you see in, like, really great nature documentaries and or you see in National Geographic. Like, are these done in the studio, or do they carry around, like, a black background with them? And they just, like, how do they do these? <laughs> That's actually a good question. <laughs> You know, I, I think like, Robin oh. is not bringing these frogs into a studio. He he's out there in the fields. That yeah. I know. Yeah, and talk about talk about a niche thing he's got going with these frogs. Yeah, definitely uh, a, a niche specialty. <laughs> but you know, they say the frogs are sort of like the canary in the coal mine. So when the frogs start dying, you know, there's something's up with the uh, with the environment. Oh. But, uh, these, I mean, these these are incredible photos of frogs. I feel like um, elementary school teachers need to buy this for for students to read and look at. I feel like little kids are always interested in frogs. <laughs> and these are cute, these are cute frogs. Not only cute are they frogs. good photos, they're cute frogs. Agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, a few weeks ago, we looked at some photos on the Washington Post about the Ebola outbreak. Pete Muller uh, is the freelance photographer that has been hired extensively in Africa. He shoots a lot of different things in Africa, and then he was assigned uh, Marianne Golan, who was also at the uh, the workshop with me, uh, sent Pete out there to Sierra Leone, and we looked at some of these photos, which are just, just stunning. You know, you look at this stuff. It's such a picturesque uh, environment, and then you see these health workers in full garb and whatnot. Um, so there was that, and then... Over on the Atlantic uh, website, there's an article um, that focuses a lot on Pete and talking about being a journalist in the midst of this outbreak and how difficult it is. And, and Marianne was actually talking about how they wanted Pete to do a little bit more immersive uh, reporting. And so if you scroll down in this article or if you go to the Washington Post website, he was actually using his iPhone to do first-person interviews with himself, just kind of describing what was going on. So in this particular video, you see uh, dispatch from the Ebola burial in the village 
um, and he's got a face mask on, and he's in the rain, and he's talking about how difficult it is uh, culturally for these people because culturally uh, in Sierra Leone, when people pass, they 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 kiss and embrace the dead, and so they they can't do that obviously with Ebola being so uh, uh, contagious and so devastating and with such a high mortality rate. Um, but really interesting to see uh, the reporting that's going on by, by Pete Muller and how dangerous it has become because in a lot of cases journalists and medical personnel are being killed because of the superstition surrounding like you know are, are they CIA agents are they actually bringing in the virus rather than trying to help the virus so all of this is going on and then this morning I see an article over on the NPPA the National Press Photographers Association website talking about how a three-time Pulitzer Prize winner Washington Post Pulitzer photographer uh, Michel Ducey was disinvited by Syracuse University due to Ebola fears. Now Michel had just returned or rather returned from Liberia 21 days ago and the incubation period for, for the virus is like 3 to 21 days so he's asymptomatic he has no symptoms he's been back for 21 days and Syracuse said, we're concerned about the perception, so we're disinviting you. Some students are oh. concerned, so you can't come anymore. Even and though he showed no symptoms from yeah. day two to day 21 of being back home. He's pissed. Yeah. He says, this is a great learning opportunity, and, and you can lead and say, hey, the, you don't have to fear monger. And this is, it, not only is it Syracuse, it's the School of Visual, uh, of visual Communications. <laughs> it's like the journalism school. Right. Well, the fear here does not make as much sense. I mean, it, it was interesting to hear the uh, photojournalist talk about experiencing fear of Ebola in such a different way than they fear um, things like car bombings or things that they're used to, like kidnappings. Yes. They're like, we know how to protect ourselves against those things, but this sort of invisible virus is terrifying to be around. So the fear there is real. The fear here should not be real and Syracuse, come on, just let, let the guy teach. It's what he wants to do. That, that's what I'm saying. You know, and, and it's one thing, you know, uh, I can see a situation. Now, the, the, the per particular conference that he was supposed to go to, he was going to actually lead like a team of journalists. They'd be one-on-one, -on -one. they'd be like sitting next to him, all this kind of stuff. Like I, I can sort of understand like ah, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, for, for the guy to get up on a lecture podium, and this is happening in a, in a bunch of places, to get up on a lecture podium and give a lecture, it's like, give me a break. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's asymptomatic. It's like, come on. I, I don't know. It, it just really upsets me to see this kind of stuff. Um, you know, and the university should have a little bit more of a backbone, to be honest. You know, they need to be able to, to stand up and say, the guy's asymptomatic, we are a place of higher learning. We believe in knowledge. The knowledge says, science says, he's not contagious. You know, we're taking uh, real precautions, and 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 disinviting him is not a real precaution. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe next year, or he'll probably say no. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there are two interesting little cameras that I found. Both of them are sort of adjunct pieces of hardware that plug into your iPhone. The first is the relaunch camera. Now, we looked at that Sony QX10 camera uh, maybe about a year ago. And the QX10 is a camera made by Sony that looks like a lens, but it's actually the sensor is in the back of that lens. And I tested it out, and it was very curious to me because there's no display on it, so you had to pair it with your camera using Bluetooth or Wi-Fi. I can't remember exactly. Um, or you could just kind of free hold it and hope you had the horizon straight and whatnot. And it was, I found it to be kind of clunky, and but apparently they're selling very well. Um, so what do I know? Um, but here the relaunch plugs into your camera, and it provides a lens, a big lens, and it connects via the Thunderbolt port, so there's no weird Wi-Fi pairing or Bluetooth pairing. Um, and it's using the Wi-Fi, and it's using the computer in your 
phone. And this looks kind of cool. And it's got a real yeah. shutter button on it. Yeah, this is definitely the most sleek uh, camera accessory for the iPhone that I've seen yet. It almost just looks like a case. It, in fact, it is. It just it, it yeah, encases it your case. phone. With extra and, battery. It's a case with extra battery, yeah. Oh, and with extra battery. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, this is definitely the sleekest design I've seen. This makes your phone, upgrades your camera phone a lot in a cool way. I'm, I'm into it. You know, we talked about uh, you know the future of cameras, and I wrote that blog post uh, kind of dissing the Nikon DF because I thought they were trying to be too retro rather than look towards the future. Yeah. And, and we've also talked about how DSLRs have no programmability uh, in the way that phones do. Like the, the ecosystem for the iPhone is so interesting because programmers can go in uh, and create all of these different apps and create uh, you know time lapse apps and zooming apps and manual control apps and whatnot. And to me, the future of cameras is this kind of computational photography. And I don't mean computational photography in terms of uh, 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 like Lytro. I, I just mean computational photography in that there's a computer that's programmable and you can do stuff with it. And that becomes very, very interesting. Because all the filters and whatnot, like why should we be holden to like Canon or Nikon or Sony to have five filters because they felt like those were the five filters. Why not let a whole community of programmers say, okay, you allowed, you allowed us to program this thing. Well, and here's the answer to that. The relaunch looks like really cool to me. So we'll see. You think you're going to try it? I don't know. I don't know that I'm going to try it, but I, <laughs> I like the idea. I like the idea. The other interesting one that we found was the Seek thermal camera. Now, I, I'm definitely not getting this, but I, again, yeah. I thought it was really interesting from a, uh, from a let's use a, let's use a device, a third-party device that we plug into our phone, let's use the processing power of the phone and, and see how we, we can extend photography and extend the functionality of the phone. So this is literally a thermal camera. This is some, like, Nancy Drew right here going yeah, on. Yeah, some crazy <laughs> stuff. So they have a couple of sample photos. I don't know if they're real or not. But they have, like, uh, footprints on the floor because there's still heat emanating from the fo footprints. So it's supposed to be kind of like a security camera. Or they show a pipe um, that has stuff in it, like a clog, which you wouldn't be able to see otherwise. So there, the interesting application of photography, interesting application of your phone, this, yeah, this gets me excited. Yeah, I, I can't see like the everyday consumer wanting to use this, but this might come into use for some businesses. Yeah, I mean, if you're like an electrician or a plumber and you can just plug that in and see like a busted pipe and then you can show the client and be like, yeah, there's something in there. That's why I'm going to charge you $500. <laughs> right, exactly. You no, know, it's like it's 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 literal transparency as well as figurative transparency. Yeah. So hey, 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 keep keep innovating, you innovators out there. <laughs> uh, the last lens piece that we're showing you today is a project uh, by Latoya Ruby Fraser, who's over in uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, which has seen better times, um, but she's documenting three generations of her family. Um, and again, it's a, it's a long-term project of something near and dear to her heart. And the result of this project is a really, really intimate look. And she's not trying to make a statement. She's African-American. Uh, she has photos of her African-American life, but she says she's not trying to make a statement or trying to be representative of African-Americans. It's simply... Her life. Yeah, simply her life, but also she, she says this is not an African-American problem. She says it's an American problem, and it's also a global problem. Which is so completely the, true. Right. So, yeah, this idea of small-town USA just going under is, is everywhere, is what she says. And I love the idea of using her family relationships to represent that larger picture. Um, it creates an intimate look, but with this larger message that is everybody needs to see and be aware of. And the result is is eerie at times. This photo is very eerie of her standing alone in a yep. dilapidated room, you know, like in her pajamas. Yeah, in her grandpa's bedroom. 
is what it says. Yeah. So and and interesting. Um, I like I like the use of black and white, uh, and it's a it. You know, when I look at the series of these photos, it makes me a little uncomfortable, to be honest. Yeah. Seeing sort of like decline of the empire in some ways. I think it, uh, you know, to her point, it's sort of representative of the larger problem mm -hmm. that we're facing. Yeah. yeah. So uh, available as a book from Aperture, published this year, 2014. The book and the series is called The Notion of Family by LaToya Ruby Frazier. You can check that out on the, on the Lens blog. This is a great time to tell you that all of the links that we're talking about today, you can find on our blog at blog.photoshelter.com. So you can check out the photos if you're not watching the uh, video with us. Uh, you watch Downton Abbey? I actually don't, but my mother does. <laughs> oh, wow, there you go. Well, I watched Downton Abbey. I watched the first three seasons uh -huh. um, and really enjoyed it. And it turns out the producers in Downton Abbey are going to be producing, I think in 2016, uh, a, a fictional TV series about the Magnum Photo Agency. This is going to be good. Yeah. From like back in the day, like from the 40s and the 50s. I'm pretty excited. I hope this is kind of like, well, I guess it'll be the Downtown Abbey of... of Photography, but I want it to be like the Mad Men of photography. The Mad Men, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I, I wonder who they're going to cast in all these roles. I know who's going to play Robert Capa. Who will play Robert Capa? Who will play him? Can oh, it be Carl? Yeah. I mean, there's so many. Like, who are you going to get? Who's going to be like the French dude? <laughs> it's exciting be because I don't think that. Have we seen uh, a TV show in recent memory that kind of. Uh, fictionalized uh, photographers as a central theme and central character besides, you know, like no. Jimmy Olsen from Spider-Man who was like... <laughs> <laughs> Not television. I mean, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, though, that just came out. and Well, yeah. that was a remake. Yeah. But other than that, I don't think so. But so, it's coming out in 2017, so we've got a ways to go. Why does it take so long? Why does it take? You know, it takes a long time to produce a show, Alan. Yeah, that's true. This is true. Well, I'm excited. I, I think um, it's it's obviously a very fertile uh, point in history. Um, World War II, uh, moving into the 50s, into the 60s, and these guys obviously titans of photojournalism. Um, so I think that'll be very very interesting. On a photo editor. Uh, Suzanne Cease, who is a very well-known consultant, wrote a little piece on the usage and pricing of photography in social media. Um, and she talks about uh, how she interviewed a number of photographers to understand how photographers are um, straddling this issue right now because more and more companies are, are asking for social media usage rights to say, okay, you shot this campaign, well, well now we also want to put it on Facebook or we want to put it on our Instagram account. Um, and I've talked to a couple of photographers who, uh, who have worked for companies who were hired specifically to shoot for social media. And we did a whole Instagram panel uh, at Photoville about a month ago That's where right. we talked to uh, the guys from Tinker Mobile, one of whom, Chris Ozer, won a Mercedes car for his work uh, with Mercedes-Benz. Um, because he got the most likes for all of his photos that they put on Instagram. Well, I'm glad that uh, Suzanne at a photo editor is getting some of these money numbers out because it's something that photographers don't usually talk about. And so it's nice to see the numbers of like, okay, the, this is what professional photographers are getting paid to do this. Here's how you can set your rates. So yeah. I'm glad this series is going up. It's interesting to see uh, these numbers. Um, and, the, you know, the one thing that, that she doesn't cover, because what, what this really is, is talking about the, the uh, usage license for the images in social media. What she doesn't cover is photographers who have massive followings and what that value is. Mm. Um, so, you know, again, we talked uh, on the Instagram panel at Photoville, some of these photographers who have half a million, a million, uh, 1.5 million, um, followers and how they're paid a lot of money simply because brands want to reach their audiences through these superstars of Instagram. 
And so that's not really even a, a licensing usage. I mean, you could construe it that way, but what it really is is you're, you're paying for an audience. Um, and so arguably you can charge a different rate than strictly uh, than strict usage. So right. I think there's a follow-on article that needs to be written, either by Suzanne or maybe by us. Maybe by us, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll see. We'll see. What do we have over here? Oh, speaking of which, really interesting article on PDN talking about the proliferation of photo blogs. So we keep talking about the lens blog, um, but there, there are a number of uh, major media outlets. Uh, Washington Post just started theirs. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Yeah. BuzzFeed, Huffington Post, um, who have photo sections and how slideshows are now being paid for, which, thank God, that's finally happening. <laughs> um, and in this particular article by David Walker, he actually quotes what people are paying uh, for some of these outlets. So uh, I think the New York Times is paying $350. Uh, CNN yeah, 375 was paying Seven. Oh, uh, Time Lightbox is paying seven hundred. Yeah. Um, really kind of great. And then, and then he also says, "Well, here are a number of people who aren't paying." <laughs> Behold, Wired's raw file, uh, feature shoot, Huffington Post, and Buzzfeed. Um, and then they also interview a couple people, um, including James Estrin. Um, and James says. Uh, if a photo blog is a labor of love, even if it's popular, they're not paying photographers. Uh, that's very different than the Huffington Post and BuzzFeed not paying, which I totally agree with. Um, and then one of the photographers says, uh, where was that quote? Uh, she said, uh, you know, it's one thing to get the exposure, and that's part of the trade sometimes. Like, if you know a million people are going to see your photos, but at the end of the day, someone's getting paid for that, and it's not, it's not me. Um, so I'm glad to see that, uh, that these people are, are, are paying. I, I, I will say, because PDN, you know, to their credit, they say, well, we don't pay. Um, you know, I think it's different when it's an industry publication. Ah, uh, how, uh, how so? Well, I think that, that something like... Uh, like Wired or Huffington Post, where they're a mainstream news organization with a very, very broad audience, um, where millions of people are going to the site a day, um, and they have a range of topics that they cover, and photography happens to be one of them which is used to generate page views, of which they can sell ad units against. That's very different than Feature Shoot. Mm-hmm. You know, and so when I see Feature Shoot kind of mentioned in the same breath of Huffington Post and saying, well, Feature Shoot doesn't pay, I'm like, well, Feature Shoot has been sh kind of showcasing photographic projects and unknown photographers or emerging photographers for many, many years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's like a labor, it is a labor of love for those guys. Yeah, and they do pay know. for original content. And they pay also. for original content, yeah. Yeah, if you're shooting for Feature Shoot, which is rare but they have a few articles up like that, so, yeah. At any rate, gr glad to see uh, the rise of the photo blog and uh, glad to see that, that publications are paying for it and publications are seeing the value of, of photography and also, uh, mentioned in the article, uh, seeing the value of kind of first rights of publication, like wanting mm -hmm. to, you know, discover photography and showcase photography. Yeah, that makes you think. When you're gonna pitch your story, you gotta you gotta be careful about who you're gonna pitch to first. You gotta go yeah, for the big well, fish and then yeah. work your way down the list. <laughs> <laughs> if you know you have good content, pick the good guy. Yep. Um, this was going around a little bit, uh, but we're we're finding this on uh, Sploid, which is part of the Gawker network, and uh, Leica in celebration of their 100th anniversary, commissioned the creation of a short film, which is a melange of different scenes, historical reenactments of famous photos. So you get, for example, uh, Eddie Adams' photo of uh, the uh, Vietnam War, um, and then you get Joe Rosenthal, Rosenthal's raising of the Iwo Jima flag, in kind of a neat little movie. Yeah. You know what they should have done? 
What's that? They should have gotten, they should have gotten John Malkovich to do all these characters. <laughs> I know. That's what they should. Have. <laughs> I was thinking of that, you know, and and we said when the Malkovich stuff came out, like, what a wonderful way to understand photography, to uh, to understand these iconic photos, and and that you ought to know every single photo. Yeah. That that Malkovich and Sandro created for that series, and similarly, like I couldn't name all the photos that that were being reenacted here. No, me either. I mean, a good but, handful, but not all of them. They, yeah. they need the sort of annotated version that links yeah. to the Wikipedia article. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, they definitely should. Can we get captions on this? Subtitles, please? Yeah. Or, you know, maybe that, again, maybe that's another good photo shelter post to break it all down. And, and Oh, yeah. Yes. Huh? I have to say the quote at the very end of this where they say, we didn't invent photography, but we invented photography. I that's know. a little weird. I don't know, like a... <laughs> It's a little arrogant on their part. I mean, I understand, like, yeah, okay, they're the guys, 35 millimeter photography, like, I get it, but you yeah. can't claim credit for all of these photos. You can't. No. No. Eddie Adams used a Nikon. <laughs> they're going to claim Come credit on. for that? No yeah. Way, yeah, if I were Nikon, I'd be like, hey, Leica, no. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. It's weird. But anyway, it's a great... It's a great little uh, movie, and it's definitely worth watching. Um, and you know what? Kudos to Leica for like doing something fun and neat. Yeah, and it's a great and well-produced video. Yeah, you know what? Leica loves photography. They do. I'm gonna so go out. I'm gonna go out on a limb and say, like, uh, yeah, we love photography too. That's that's the name of the, the name of the broadcast. That could have been their quote. We didn't invent photography, but we love it. <laughs> Sarah, we always try to end on something more fun, and uh, for for those of you listening to the uh, the podcast, you know, every week Sarah and I we have a, a shared Google Doc, and we just throw stuff on the Google Doc, um, and then you know, an hour before we actually do the live broadcast, we kind of look at the stuff, and then we make our notes on the side, and then we and then we just do the broadcast. And you slipped in a little something to end with. I <laughs> because originally we're going to end with the Leica stuff, and you slipped in a little something uh, about pizza photography. About pizza photography, yes. This <laughs> week um, I got to interview Jean-Paul Jean Douglas, who is the creator behind Pizza in the Wild, which has gone viral on Instagram. He basically throws pizzas into random situations and takes photos, these beautiful photos of them. And, uh, yeah, I have a good friend who hosts a radio show on Heritage Network called Pizza Party, and she was interviewing John Paul, and I got to sit in. And he is an awesome dude, very talented guy, and just creates these beautiful pictures, all for the love of pizza, which makes it even better. <laughs> awesome stuff. Did you pick up any uh, food, pizza, photography tips? You know, uh, he uses Little Caesars pizzas. Um, <laughs> sometimes he lets them harden, is what he said. And he was like, and sometimes if this shoot isn't successful, I just eat them. So <laughs> I like so, that attitude. Yeah. I know. He's got a great attitude. <laughs> well, you know what? That makes sense because when the pizza is too hot, it's like floppy. Right. So exactly. So you want it to congeal a little bit, right? Exactly. Yep. Uh, see, yep. you know, you can't just go out and take photos of anything. You need to, you need a little domain expertise in about what you're photo photographing. Yeah, it's true. That's so yeah, anyway, tune in to Pizza Party after this. <laughs> yeah. So where can they find that? Well, on that link that we will share on the blog. Okay. Well, there you go. You can download the podcast. It's Sarah Jacobs uh, on Heritage Radio. Yep. For the Pizza Party. <laughs> Yeah, pizza party. Podcast. <laughs> yes. Talking about pizza. Well, I can't say that uh, we will ever do another podcast from Taipei. And, you know, considering it's uh, now 12.30 in the morning for me. <laughs> Are you tired now, Friday Alan? Night, I'm a little tired, but I might also just go get a drink because it's, you know, it's Friday night. Yeah, me. yeah. But next week, uh, we'll be back uh, in New York. And, you know, th there was so much. It, we didn't do the broadcast for two weeks. And there were so many little other things that we could have talked about. But we have to keep the show, you know, under an hour. 
I mean, we could be here for 24 hours. <laughs> we could. But we're not going to have a show for that long. Until the end of the year wrap-up, then we might do it. Then we might do it. <laughs> oh, that's going to be epic. I, I look forward to that. <laughs> Um, but hey, Sarah, uh, we'll see you uh, next week, huh? Okay. Safe travels back to the U.S., Alan. Thank you very much. And for everyone who joined us here on the uh, live show and listening to the podcast or watching the video on YouTube, thanks for joining us for another episode of I Love Photography. For Sarah Jacobs, this is Alan Murabayashi signing off from Taiwan. Bye-bye.